All right. Well, uh, welcome back, everybody. Good morning once again. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, uh, depending again, whichever part of the world we're logging in today. And we are delighted and honored to have uh, Professor Sir John Pendry as our speaker today as part of the, uh, the Mysteries of the Universe Institute lecture series at the Indian Institute of Technology, Turkey. Uh, Professor Pendry is a condensed matter theorist and uh, he has worked at Imperial since 1981. He began his career in the Cavendish Laboratory, Cambridge, followed by six years at the Daresbury Laboratory where he headed the theoretical group. He has worked extensively on electronic and structural properties of surfaces, developing the theory of low energy diffraction and of electronic surface states. More recently, he turned his attention to photonic materials. This interest led to his present research into the remarkable electromagnetic properties of materials where the normal response to electromagnetic fields is reversed, leading to negative values for the refractive index. In collaboration with scientists at uh, Marconi, uh, he designed a series of metamaterials, completely novel materials with properties not found in nature. These designs were subsequently the basis for new concepts with radical consequences, such as the first material with a negative refractive index and a prototype cloaking device, uh, which have uh, both caught the imagination of the world's media. And in fact, I like to uh, say that, uh, like my daughter is a big Harry Potter fan. So <laughs> she, uh, when I told her about you and the, and the, the cloaking device, <laughs> as you can imagine, the thing that came, the first thing came to her mind was, hey, you, 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 can, uh, you can make Harry Potter happen in real life. I said, well, uh, why don't you uh, have yeah. a listen in? Huh? <laughs> so- Turn into a- <laughs> <laughs> so um, now Professor Pendry has a has a, a very long list of awards and honors, uh, some of which in a reverse chronological order include in 2019, uh, uh, he was awarded with the Mozi Prize of the SPI. So SPI is a Society of Photo Optical Instrumentation Engineers in recognition of his eminent contributions to the development of the perfect lens. 2016, he received the Dan, uh, the Dan David Prize. In 2014, he was a co-recipient of the Kavli Prize in Nanoscience, awarded by the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. In 2013, he won the Institute of Physics Isaac Newton Medal. In 2008, an issue of Journal of Physics in Condensed Matter was dedicated to him in honor of his 65th birthday. In 2004, he was knighted in the birthday honors list in 94, he was a recipient of the BBC Medal and Prize awarded by the British Vacuum Council. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1984. So with this uh, uh, brief introduction, I would uh, request uh, Professor Pendry to kindly deliver his lecture. Professor Pendry, please. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen and hopefully the lecture will emerge. Um, yeah. Oops, um, it's not going into, uh, there it is, yes, good. I hope everybody can see that. Yeah, um, it's perfect, yeah. Good. Um, what I want to talk about today, has been said already, is, uh, well, first I should thank you for inviting me this, this prestigious lecture series, which attracts such a phenomenal number of, I might say an intimidating number of people, if I were, facing the more than a thousand people in a lecture hall, I, I think I might quake a little bit. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to tell you about um, some new materials, uh, not so new now, because we've been doing things with them over the years called metamaterials, uh, which are new to electromagnetism and enable us things we couldn't do before. And also I want to tell about um, uh, a new concept in, in design, which enables us to um, shape these metamaterials and make them do the extraordinary things uh, which we can with them. So here in a, um, a nutshell is, is the story of metamaterials. Um, it's a very simple one, really. Um, when uh, electricity and therefore light interacts with the material, it does so by polarizing the atoms and molecules. And what the light sees, because its wavelength is very much greater than the uh, size of an atom or a molecule, is, is an average over many, many atoms and molecules. So you're working in terms of average 
fields when you talk about the optical response of a, a material or indeed the electric and magnetic responses. Um, and so you can ask the question, um, do the thing polarize have to be as small as an atom and molecule? And the answer is no, because an atom or a molecule is uh, pretty small. It's less than a nan nanometer typically. And the wavelength of light is, is only a bit less than a micron. So there's a factor of a thousand. And in between, you can imagine polarizing structures which are not individual atoms or molecules, which are actually things you can make in nanotechnology. And indeed, if you're working with longer wavelengths, uh, microwaves or terahertz radiation, where the wavelength is even longer, then these structures don't have to be nanometers. They, they can be millimeters in the terms of uh, um, megahertz radiation. And, uh, and the idea is that um, instead of using chemistry, to alter the properties of the material and make it do what we want to, we have the geometry of the structures we make. And because there's a lot more geometry than there are atoms in the periodic table, uh, the flexibility uh, that you have when you introduce this concept of a metamaterial is, is quite astonishing. Um, and you can make properties using the metamaterials which have uh, not been observed in uh, nature. Now, to fully exploit this design, there's a new technique called transformation optics. Um, I'll speak about this more after I've uh, talked about metamaterials, but basically it's a way of uh, controlling electromagnetic field, uh, doing it in a way that's intuitive, but at the same time compatible with Maxwell's equations, and I'll, I'll elaborate on it in my talk. Um, so that's just uh, showing again this concept of what a metamaterial is. Um, remark that uh, the metamaterial concept applies uh, over all wavelengths up to the visible and indeed into the ultraviolet as well. You begin to run out of steam when you get into the uh, soft x-ray region because uh, even a metamaterial has itself to be made of a material and you're running out of suitable material responses when you get into the uh, the, the x-ray region and outside that. But very extensive range of frequencies it can operate in. Uh, also, the concept has been applied to other fields. So uh, people in acoustics are using structures to engineer how sound uh, can be controlled. And one of my former postdocs, Sebastian Gueno, has even suggested that by drilling holes in the ground and making a, a meta surface to control the way earthquakes, uh, which are waves, how earthquakes move around, perhaps deflect them from um, uh, valuable infrastructure. So widely accepted. Here's where for us started. Um, I was working with the Marco and they said um, we we would like a, a material with a magnetic response at uh, radio frequencies they were working on radar waves so that's 10 centimeters this structure I'm showing you here is about structures about a centimeter across and they, they wanted some magnetism but they wanted to do it without including uh, heavy and expensive magnetic materials um, and it's, it's often the case that techniques that you are used in optics um, are microwave because the engineering is so much easier there, it's bigger, or, um, e e easier to do. And that's certainly the truth with metamaterials, which are now migrated to optics, but began their life in microwaves and still have a, an important role there. Um, so this, this first structure actually did create a lot of interest. And uh, let me explain how we, we made magnetism using non-magnetic copper. Uh, and you see here a series of rings. And if you put a magnetic field normal to that ring, um, 
uh, time-varying magnetic field, it will induce a current that wants to flow around this ring here. And if the current flowed around the ring, then that current itself would produce a magnetic response to the incident magnetic field. And so by making rings, you can make a structure which effectively has magnetism. But we did something else. Uh, of course, it turns out that a, a, a ring on its own is, is not very interesting ma magnetically. And what you can see here is these are split rings. So the current can't flow around this inner ring nor around the outer ring because they, they split, they deliberately cut a segment out. But current can flow because uh, there's some capacitance between the inner and the outer ring. And so the uh, the electrical current jumps across the capacitance and it can flow around by exploiting these capacitative jumps. And what you have here is current flowing around in a circle, which makes an inductance. And to do so, it has capacitance. Capacitance inductor, it makes a resonant circuit. And this circuit resonates about 10 gigahertz, it turns out. Now, resonances have some interests, and let me explain them by making the analogy with a child's swing. Um, if you have uh, a young kid on a swing, you push it very slowly, of course, and it goes gently in the direction that you push the swing, uh, obvious, I guess. If it turns out uh, you have uh, on the swing and his friend is pushing it, his friend will try to push the swing very quickly to annoy uh, his other friend as much as he can, of course. But what you find is that um, as the swing has a, a, its own frequency, so if you just let it loose, uh, it will swing at a natural resonant frequency. Then if you try to make it swing faster than that frequency, you will find that it in fact goes in the opposite direction to the direction you push. And this is characteristic of nearly all resonance through these electrical circuits as well. So you find that uh, when you uh, change the frequency of the magnetic field on this structure, that there comes a point where you get a very strong response of resonance. And on the other side of that response, the magnetic response is the opposite to the direction you're pushing in. And that's very strange. Um, and it's something which is uh, very rarely found in, in nature. And it's something which excited a lot of attention. Because some years previous to our work in 1968, uh, a Russian scientist called Victor Veselago had made us of uh, materials which uh, he postulated had a negative refractive index. There's nothing in physics which uh, says that you can't have a negative refractive index, um, but it turns out in nature that there are no materials found in nature which have a negative refractive index. Um, and so it was that, that this negative magnetism was of interest because uh, Vesselago gave a formula which are, are a prescription for making negative refractions. And I'll come to how that operates in a moment. His formula was that you have to make both the electric and the magnetic response negative. And then when you do that, you get a third negative, which is the refractive index, which turns out to be negative. And fine, there are materials with a negative epsilon. Silver has a negative epsilon, and we use that. Um, copper has a negative epsilon um, at visible frequencies, but there are no materials with a negative um, permeability. So Veselago's work attracted a lot of interest. So they all died down because you couldn't make this stuff. And then I was giving a, a talk on, on this material at uh, Laguna Beach in California. And in the audience were David Smith and Shelley Schultz, who are certainly paying great friends and collaborators. And they said, can we make this stuff? Because we want to combine these, these two things. We'd also designed something with a negative permittivity. <laughs> we want to combine them in one structure. And this is what they made. They made this structure here, which has these split rings, which are now split squares in their manifestation. And also there's a, a copper wire on the other side of the board. Can you see that 
shadowy thing there. That's a copper wire which resonates and that gives you a negative electrical response. The rings can give you a neg negative magnetic response. And so this structure was the first structure that made um, first realization of a, a negative refractive index. Um, and it was very dramatic um, in that uh, there was a, a lot of argument, uh, negative refractive indexes, as I, I will show you in a moment, uh, create a lot of paradoxes and, and people argued a lot about whether what was seen was real, why it wasn't an artifact. And so um, actually, although that controversy was a little bit painful at the time, it was in fact very useful in getting people interested in the subject because there's nothing like a good argument between two scientists to attract a lot of other scientists to, uh, to an issue. So this structure was the start of a lot of interest in realizing negative refractive index and realizing Vesselago's dream, Vesselago's dream. One of the nicer things about the evolution of the subject is that uh, Victor, Victor Vessel uh, was still alive at that time. He, he, he was quite old in his uh, 80s and he, he, he lived to see his uh, negative refractive index uh, made and actually took part in the development. Sadly, Victor died a couple of years ago, but it was a very happy time for him. Um, now, that first structure, which I've just showed you, made negative refractive index at uh, uh, RF frequencies, but uh, subsequently people wanted to push this to the vision. And this is the next structure, which was made by Jang Sang's group in Berkeley. And here's a, a figure of it showing uh, that it's a layer of silver and a layer of uh, magnesium fluoride um, and with holes in it. So it's a metamaterial. And there's a, an electron micrograph of, of the structure to a scale of one micrometer. And this has a, a, a negative response and near visible frequencies. So it, it, again, we're spanning the range. Um, and since those days, materials have uh, expanded what they do quite a lot. At DC, you can make a giant paramagnet paramagnetism, that is a, a material that polarizes in uh, the opposite way to the magnetic field, even at, uh, at DC. Um, you can make uh, pickup coils for magnetic resonance imaging using mass materials. That's done by Richard Sims at my college. And actually, uh, the new 5G cell phone um, has uh, uh, extensively employed metamaterials. I was visiting the Huawei labs two years ago, and they were very enthusiastic about how their new technology heavily exploited metamaterials. It's also been used to in satellite communications to make a cheap and light phase array much less expensive and heavy than the traditional satellite dish. Uh, enhances terahertz lasers to make them more efficient, controls thermal radiation, and in the visible, uh, the subject of plasmonics, is, um, which uh, the, the way the uh, electron density oscillates the surfaces to make a surface plasmon is very much affected by the shape of the surface. So they're ideal, it's an ideal context, this plasmonics for making uh, metamaterial structures that control the, the resonances. And using them, you can enhance nonlinear phenomena. And uh, by using the um, negative um, um, permittivity to concentrate the light very strongly, you can uh, make single molecule detection possible. Actually, that's uh, through the Raman effect. And I was into the a Raman Institute for a month in the 1990s. Um, and it was Raman, of course, who discovered the Raman effect. And he got uh, one of the first, uh, may have even been the first Indian Nobel Prize for, for that discovery. And his uh, discovery is now exploited extensively for uh, detecting what sort of molecules you have there. And it can now be made very sensitive. And in acoustic soundproofing of domestic environment and stealth technology for submarines and so on. 
even been applied in static mechanics uh, where you can by making a structure of uh, rods and wires and so on and so forth you can make structures with very curious properties like uh, a negative Poisson's ratio which means that if it, normally if you squeeze a rubber sponge in this direction it will go out in the opposite direction but you can make materials where you squeeze them in this direction and it goes in in the opposite direction as well negative Poisson's ratio really weird <clears throat> so back to this negative refractive index business and um, uh, I, I like this <coughs> picture here uh, which uh, is uh, coordinates are epsilon the permittivity and mu the permeability and when they're both positive that makes a dielectric like glass or water which is transparent and uh, you can see that mathematically because the square root for the wave vector inside a material is proportional to the square root of epsilon times mu which makes the refractive index there are other materials like metals which have a, a negative permittivity and when you make one of these guys but not both negative make one of them negative then the wave vector becomes imaginary and instead of getting a wave which propagates through a material making it transparent you get a wave which uh, decays exponentially and it's because of this negative epsilon that metals are opaque and so on and so forth the same would happen if you made just mu negative Another story is if you make both of them negative, Vesalago showed that what you have to do is rather than take the positive square root here, um, you could make the argument that since uh, you're multiplying two minus signs together, when you take the square root, you've just got to pick one of them. But I don't think a mathematician would believe that argument. The proper argument is in terms of causality. And causality demands that if both of these are negative, then you must choose the negative square root to be consistent with causality. Uh, so that's how Vesselago told us to make negative refractive index. These materials are transparent but different. Also very, very different this region here, as I will show. So that's Victor's formula, and he told us to choose the negative square root. So moving on, um, another definition of a negative refractive index is how um, light rays refract at the surface, surface of a material. And this is Snell's law. And if you define a negative refractive index, and instead of the light as it normally would going this side of the normal, the angle becomes negative and it makes a chevron shape of the surface, which is very characteristic of negative refraction. So that is the signature of negative refraction, this negative angle when you go inside the medium. Um, I said that negative refraction and metamaterials are full of surprises. And here you bump into the first surprise. And it really threw quite a lot of people as to what was going on. But when you think about it a bit, you can reconcile things because um, this is a ray picture, which imagines that light is a set of particles, which uh, just make negative refractive index here. And you might argue if that's as far as you thought about it, uh, what's the big deal? It bends negative rather than positive. We know about negative numbers, we can handle them. But when you think deeper, uh, there's a, a, another law that you have to take into account. And this that uh, light has a wave-like nature and it has a wave vector. And it's an immutable law of mathematical physics that if you take the projection of that wave vector along the surface here, then that projection has to be conserved in magnitude and direction as you cross the surface. So if the light is heading in this direction and you want to conserve the parallel wave vector, then you are forced to choose a wave vector which is in the opposite direction to the ray.
So we're very used in the vacuum and in ordinary dielectric that the wave vector points in the same direction as, as the ray vector. But in metamaterials, it cannot do so because it would violate these laws of conservation if it did so. And that means that the waves are headed in an entirely different direction, in the opposite direction, in fact, to the, um, the energy. How does that pan out? Well, you can describe the energy flow by making a packet of waves. So here I, I made a packet of waves and the red arrow shows where the group velocity is going. That's this ray refraction picture here. So the energy is headed off to the right. But inside that wave packet, you, you have the waves which constitute the packet. And these um, waves uh, refused to go in this direction. They headed in this direction. In fact, they headed so rapidly that an observer would see them going in the backward direction rather than the forward direction. So they seem to start at this end and then they exit the other end and they travel. And that's a sort of w very, very weird effect. Um, it's, it's never seen in naturally occurring materials because no naturally occurring materials have a negative refractive index, but it is sometimes seen in, uh, say, uh, waves on water, uh, where they can be highly dispersive. That's a requirement that this can happen, it turns out. And, and so sometimes if you toss a pebble in the pot, the waves going backwards, whilst the wave packet goes forward. And in fact, it's a bit like a clock in that the um, the phase of a, a, a wave registers its progress in time and space. And if somehow you're unwinding that, if the waves are going backwards relative to the direction of travel, and somehow you, 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 you're unwinding something that's happening. And we'll come to that when we talk about Pesolado's lens. And indeed, negative refraction is not the same as time reversal, but it's, it's very closely related to time reversal. And that brings me to uh, uh, one of Veselago's other uh, su suggestions. And what he pointed out was that if you um, could make some of this negative refracting stuff, then it would focus light. It's not a lens, um, uh, but it is focusing property. People call it a lens, even though it isn't, because a lens is a curved, curved surface. That's what lens means. Lenticular means curve. It's after, actually after a lentil that you make dal from. Um, so this, this lens, because you have this negative refraction, the rays are bent back towards the axis and cross the axis at the focal point. And actually, when they release from this, they, they do the trick a second time because this negative, negative refraction um, happens again as you cross this second surface of the slab and you get a second focus here. Um, rather strange lens um, and you can imagine it, it has uh, rather strange properties. So um, um, another definition of the refractive index that we were taught at school is that um, when you look down into uh, uh, a transparent medium and um, things seem to be nearer the surface than they actually are. So if, if you're at the swimming pool and you're trying to out how deep the water is because you can't swim too well, um, then it's easy to misjudge because the water looks much shallower than it really is. And the ratio of the real depth to the apparent depth is the refractive index. So if the refractive index is negative, uh, and the real depth is positive, as is the case with this fish in the pond here, then the apparent must be negative. And when you look at the pond, you see the fish swimming in uh, empty air there. <laughs> so that's, that's another paradox you see uh, with um, light bending the wrong way. Um, and this leads me on to transformation optics. How, how do we control 
all these strange things which uh, metamaterialists, negative refraction and all that stuff can enable you to do. How do we make it controllable rather than just say, gee whiz, I'm surprised by that. How do we make it happen? Um, you'll be all familiar with Snell's law, the ray approximation, refraction discrete surfaces. Um, but of course, it's the ray approximation is ignores the wave na nature of light. It doesn't know anything about waves. It doesn't know about diffraction. Uh, it doesn't know about uh, the reflection of surfaces, for example. Though you don't just get refraction, you get reflection. But none of these things. And yet, uh, Snell's law, as, as a, um, a formula for designing optics, has survived for centuries. And you might ask, why is that? And the reason is that although we have Maxwell's equations, uh, what Snell's law and the ray approximation gives is a physical picture of what's going on. So in your mind's eye, you can see that light will reflect to the surface. And you can see how if you change that surface, then the light might respect. Now I challenge you to look at Maxwell's equations and say, ah oh, yes, I know immediately without thinking how to design a lens, a structure that will focus light. Um, it's, they're not transparent enough. Um, so instead, what we wanted to do was to extract from Maxwell's equations uh, entities which look a bit like rays and what Maxwell equations are based on are these um, field lines, the electric and magnetic field lines. And if we work in terms of those, we can actually have a physical picture of what's going on. And if we can learn how we change a medium to manipulate them and still stay con consistent with Maxwell, then we can have a more exact procedure. And that's what we try to do with transformation optics. Um, now, at this moment, I, I evoke the great man himself, because he's really at the center of the transformation optics uh, story. Um, and Einstein was a great admirer of uh, James Clark Maxwell. Uh, he, he said that Maxwell's theory of light and reconciling it with mechanics was actually the basis of his uh, special theory of relativity. Although, of course, he then went on to gen develop the general theory. And in fact, he, in his study at Princeton, uh, Einstein had a portrait of Maxwell, Maxwell above the fireplace. He was such an admirer of him. The problem that Maxwell um, posed um, uh, was that uh, in um, the, 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 the light uh, was a wave and he'd established it was a wave. Uh, but the problem was, what was it a wave in? And now previous, well, uh, previous to Einstein rather, um, people had thought of empty space in which light can travel as completely empty, uh, with no properties, a vacuum, uh, they ran out of words for nothingness to describe empty space. And, and yet here was a wave propagating through empty space. And every other wave that people knew about, sound waves, water waves, uh, and so forth, um, they propagated through a medium, water or air, uh, what have you. What was the medium that carried light? We spoke about the luminiferous ether. And then the question rose, if there is something there in ether, how fast was it traveling? And all those paradoxes. And um, Einstein came up with a completely different explanation of how these things worked. And it really all goes back to, to Michael Faraday because the electric and magnetic field on which Maxwell's equations are built um, really uh, were invented or postulated by Faraday. Now, before Faraday, people thought about electricity and magnetism and the forces they generated as action at a distance. So if you have a positive and uh, two positive charges or positive and negative charge, they exert forces on one another. And the way that force was described was in terms of something called action at a distance. The action was instantaneous 
and a force acted on the line along the line the two charges. Now that's the simplest way of describing something uh, like a force at the level it was understood at that time. Um, but and Occam's razor says if there are many explanations of a phenomenon, you should always choose the simplest. But that's not always uh, a productive um, way of looking at things, because sometimes you use a more complicated description, which is actually capable of being generalized into something more sophisticated. And that's what Crowley did. So Crowley said, no, no, it's not accidents that uh, an electric charge or a magnetic pole is surrounded by something you call the field. And whether or not that field is acting on a second charge, it exists independently of it creating a force. But it's a field which surrounds the charge which conveys the force. So Faraday introduced this, this concept of uh, a, a third entity, the field, which carries the force. And if you think about it, that's remarkable because Faraday was the son of a blacksmith who is almost entirely ignorant of mathematics. And yet he created this entity, the field, which has been the cornerstone of much of theoretical physics um, since Maxwell's time. I think that's rather remarkable. So, uh, um, Faraday said uh, forces are converted by fields, and you could say that Einstein's approach was, which which up to that time was spoken about in a Newtonian way of action at a distance between two massive objects, a line, the line of separating them. And Einstein said, like Faraday, no, that's not the way things happen. Um, gravity has a field surrounding it, and the field was the geometry of space and space he thought of as just another material which can be described by its curvature and um, which is described by um, uh, the, the geometrical properties uh, through his metric and what's more this curvature can be altered by massive objects and that's the way gravity is created um, so that uh, uh, the Earth orbits around the Sun because it is in the gravitational field. Uh, it experiences the Sun's metric, and which and the space is slightly curved, and so uh, the the Earth go in a Newtonian straight line. It moves in a, a curve, and that's the way Einstein thought of that. And if you can't carry that picture to its logical conclusion, you would also conclude that if light moves in a curved space, then it too should follow uh, a curved path. And that was a very radical conclusion of the general theory of relativity. The prediction was that if you watched a star pass behind the sun, a massive object, the star should move in the sky to a position where, apparent position where it wasn't really so. And that experiment conducted by Arthur Stanley Eddington in 1919 um, was one of the uh, experiments on, on which the, the truth of um, Einstein's predictions uh, was based. Uh, really quite an emotional collaboration because 1919 was just after the World War between England and Germany and, and France. And uh, Einstein and Eddington were passionate opponents of that war. And this experimental collaboration was seen as something approaching a reconciliation between uh, the two nations. Um, uh, Eddington was a Quaker and very supposed to. Um, so, um, the other thing that follows from this is that if you rewrite Maxwell's equations in the language of Einstein's curved space, which uh, easily do, um, then what you find is that this quantity which describes the geometry of space, the metric, it crops up in Maxwell's equations in exactly the same space place as the refractive index. 
And that is another way of seeing why um, light traveling past the sun is uh, refracted because effectively space has a refractive index as far as light is concerned and the sun is a sort of lens. And we're going to exploit that concept by playing uh, uh, geometry against refractive index. So uh, as far as lighting is concerned, we can make the observation that to bend space, we don't have to have a massive object. We can think as though once there, but we can fake a massive object for light by changing the refractive index. Here, just for fun, is uh, an example of a really, really strong gravitational field. Uh, this is a Hubble telescope picture, one of many very beautiful ones. In the centre of that galaxy, which is really, really massive, behind it is a blue galaxy. And the light being bent around the red galaxy, so despite the blue being behind the red, it, it, the, the red galaxy's gravitational lensing is now quite an established part of astronomy. And we exploited this uh, quite a long time ago now, in 1996. And uh, the idea was as follows, that um, Einstein allowed us to think of space as a malleable substance. You might just rubber, something that can be deformed. Um, so if you want to control where the field of electric and magnetic, then you can push them around by imagining that they're embedded in this uh, rubber substance, which is in space. And by pushing and pulling, you can distort field lines which are carried along in this rubber sheet. Distorting the sheet, you can um, make the field lines do pretty well much what you want. And that's the basis of transformation optics, and it's called transformation optics because this distortion of the sheet, if you start off with this Cartesian system here, and this is definitely not Cartesian, you can, distort, you can describe that a coordinate transformation. And the Einstein's equations show you how to transfer that distortion of space into a distortion of a refractive index through epsilon and mu, which comprise the refractive index, of course. And the, these equations are described in terms of the first derivative of the coordinate uh, transformation. Um, so um, you can, as I said, uh, that a distortion of space, you can mimic for light by um, actually changing epsilon and mu. Um, but sometimes this can relate to very sort of difficult to uh, achieve distortions, but metamaterials are very, very flexible in what they can do. And they can quite often easily make um, distortions of uh, the refractive index by changing their internal structure continuously so that instead of light being reflect, refracted suddenly at an interface, it's continuously bent as you move through a, a medium. Now, those who are mathematical amongst you will um, like that formula, but uh, others of a more physical bent will say, well, that's just another formula. How, how does that improve on Maxwell's equations in terms of and ability. Well, there is, in fact, a simple way that you can describe the effect of compression of space, uh, and uh, I'll present it now. On the left, you see a ray of light, um, a pointing vector that behaves like field lines, so we can take that as uh, a representative of what might happen when we distort space. And the distortion I'm going to make is the simplest one you can possibly make, which is just a uniform compression of that inner region of space. And so if I do that, creating the blue compressed region there, you see that the light moves in a zigzag line. Then by asking the question, what refractive index does, and um, what epsilon and mu do you have to have, if the light is to move in that trajectory, you can work out what the compression has done to epsilon and mu. And the answer is very, very simple. So if you compress by a factor of alpha, 
then along the direction of compression, the component of epsilon and mu in that direction is decreased by that same small factor alpha. Conversely, normal to that direction of compression, epsilon and mu are increased by the inverse of epsilon. And you can make any distortion of space you want by compressing along three axes and rotating the cells. So I could crawl over on the right with a ruler and a protractor and I could tell you what the refractive index, what epsilon and mu are for each of these cells here. I'm going to exploit that uh, physical picture of it in the future. Now we thought we had uh, a pretty powerful set of tools here. We, we, we've got the uh, mathematical technique to design things and we have the materials that we can make to order to realize those uh, designs. And so we wanted a really, really difficult task, a task which people would recognize as being very difficult to achieve, which could easily be done using this technology. And that task was to make something invisible. I've half regretted that because it's, it's become such an industry since that, that I, I sometimes can't live without it. Anyway, so here it is, the challenge of invisibility. Um, so what's the problem with making some something invisible? It's easy enough to stop the light reflecting from something. You just paint it black and that's conventional stealth technology. Stealthy aeroplanes, essentially, you take a pot of black paint, it doesn't reflect with your radar, and you paint it all over. But you can, in fact, see so-called stealthy planes because they leave a shadow if they fly over a, uh, an area full of mobile phone signals it makes a shadow and by tracking the uh, mobile phone mass you can tell where has played by the stealthy and the problem is that what you have to do to uh, make something truly invisible is that not only must you not see the object itself but you must not see the cloak. So the cloak and the object together have to be truly invisible. And when you do that, you can make Peter Pan, that you're, you're looking at in Kensington Gardens, uh, vanish. And Peter Pan, if you know the story, is a little boy who lost his shadow. How do we do that? How do you do that using transformation optics? Um, well, if we didn't have transformation optics, why would it be a different um, uh, uh, problem? Why would it be a very, very hard problem? Uh, so this is what you have to do. Um, a light ray has to enter the cloak. The cloak has to guide that light ray so that wherever and whatever angle it enters, it has to avoid this central region here around it. And furthermore, when that ray of light reaches the far surface of the cloak, and so here's the hidden object, here's a cloak which is confined within this outer sphere here. When the ray of light reaches the far sphere, it has to remember the direction it was traveling in before. So that it leaves at the precise point that a ray going in a straight line would leave here, travel in the same direction. That's a tall order. So if, if you're a professor and you look to the problem, you say, oh gosh, it'll take forever. I'll have my research student do it. And then if you're a research student, you scratch your head and you say, well, how on earth do I solve this problem to get my PhD? Because yes, I can steer the light here, but how, how on earth do I remember that it's got to exit here and what's more it's got to do it from every position here and every angle too so it, it's a big challenge and you could ask a computer to try and solve it for you but it would take a lot of computer time and i'm going to show you the problem is easily and simply solved with transformation optics almost trivially so and that's the power of the technique so i start off with some of this space which as we know is made of rubber 
and I'm going to make a hole in the middle of it and that hole I'm going to enlarge to make the hidden space in which I can hide any object I want. And as I make the hole, I'm going to compress the rubber, the space, into the cloak, which is this annulus which surrounds the hidden region here. And as I compress, then I know what's going to happen. Of course, I've just given you the formula. The uh, epsilon and mu will become anisotropic in this angular direction here. There'll be a large value of epsilon and mu. And in this radial direction here, there'll be a smaller value of epsilon and mu. And you can calculate what that is because here's a transformation of coordinates, very, very simple. It could be many different things, but this is the simplest one of just a uniform compression of radial compression of that piece of space. And if you apply that formula, you can find what epsilon mu must make that cloak. So I, I, I can tell you in just a few words without spending a lot of um, time worrying about how the um, uh, light moves and so on and so forth. Um, I know that that will create a cloak. Why do I know that? Because I have only fiddled with space inside the cloak. So I know that I have hidden the object because I've pushed all of space out of there. I can fill this with any sort of space I want now. It doesn't matter. There's an event horizon here. Light can across it. A bit like I made something a bit like a black hole. It isn't really, but it's, it's a bit like a black hole. And my distortion of space has been confined to the cloaking region. So I only distort space in the cloaking region, and that is the only place in which I disturb the trajectory of the light rays. Therefore, outside the cloak, the light rays follow the same trajectory that they would have. They have no knowledge of what's gone on inside the cloak. You don't have to worry about how I'm steering them and so on and so forth. You just do the transformation. You make sure that you don't transform anything outside the cloak and it does the job. It does the job of only for rays. And in fact, it will do the same job for any field lines, including static field lines. And um, in 2007, Brian Wood and uh, myself, Ben Wood rather, and myself, we, we showed how to design a cloak which would uh, um, hide something from magnetic fields. Uh, back to the RF cloak, that was first realized by uh, David Smith, um, who uh, made a metamaterial cloak for radar waves. I explained that metamaterials are easier to make at uh, RF frequencies because the structures are bigger, millimetric. Here are the metamaterial structures which reproduce the refractive index that you make to hide this region here and, and to steer waves around the structure. Uh, and here is, is uh, David's experiment. So this is what happens if you do the ideal design and have ideal materials and so on and so forth. Here are some waves entering from the left, the rays are in black. Uh, the waves are captured by the cloak. They never enter the hidden object here. And they emerge the other side just as if there's nothing here. The acid test is that these lines are parallel, so you, you, you see what's behind the cloak. It isn't distorted, and you can see through the cloak. It's as if it were transparent. And if you simulate that with um, using instead of the ideal parameters, the one you can actually realize experimentally, you see that, well, it works, but uh, in fact, you see a little um, gray patch here in, in the sky, um, but the lines are straight. So you can actually see through the cloak, the rays are coming through. If you had a solid copper cylinder, uh, you, you would see everything go all over the place. And here's the experiment showing these nice parallel lines. You can see through the cylinder and the waves are pretty much excluded from the entire inside. So that was the first experimental confirmation. People have done much cleverer things since that original work, but uh, that uh, showed how it would happen. And in my final minutes, um, of course, time is rolling on. I want to tell you about something even more 
remarkable that emerges from this story. I mentioned Vesalago's lens before, and um, it, it, it was recognized that um, this lens would, in fact, focus light, but it was assumed uh, throughout that time that it um, obey Abbey's law. Now, Abbey recognized that if you have an object which has some very, very fine details in it, which are, um, you, you then shine light on to create uh, very, very fine electric and magnetic fields in that object, only some of those fields can escape. Only the ones which have uh, a longer length structure in the surface can escape into the far field. The others remain trapped on the surface in what's called the near field. And the far field, because it only contains these long wavelengths, uh, can only resolve things of the order of a quarter of a wavelength. And that's the Abbey limit. And it was thought to be a, a cast iron law of optics. Um, but in 2000, I, when I heard about uh, Vesalago's lens for the first time, I thought, well, this lens is different from other lenses. It's not curved for one thing. And also there were some peculiar things that it, it seemed to do some things very, very precisely. Um, and so I asked the question, um, what if I apply Maxwell's equations to this lens rather than Snell's law? What if I apply Maxwell's equations and I ask, how perfect is the fo focus? And the answer was, using mathematics that uh, our graduates could use after a course, course of Maxwell's equations, that the focus was and I was appalled by that conclusion because I knew that everybody would be after saying it was wrong and they were, <laughs> but it turned out that it was right. Now, let me try and explain in terms of transformation optics, why that lens is perfect. And again, we ignore details of the refraction, reflection and so on and so forth. We just think about this, this picture of space. So here's a bit of space. And I'm going to bend it. So remember that picture way back when I compress space uniformly. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. So I'm going to squash this piece of space. OK, and I squash it more and more. And um, epsilon and mu perpendicular to this plane get bigger and bigger. And eventually I get to this point here and they become infinity. Now, if you look at the function one upon x, which diverges when x is zero, then you know it merges the other side, one upon x becomes plus infinity, then it suddenly jumps to minus infinity. And that's exactly what happens here if you look at the formula of compression. And so now when you've compressed this thing and you've pushed uh, the space back on itself to make three manifolds, then you made this bit of space negatively refracting. If you apply this, this law, just blindly applying the mathematics, you find a piece of space, which is, and also look at the weird space you've made. This isn't ordinary space. This space is convoluted. It has three manifolds and that's why the lens works. Because as the light is being focused in the lens, what you think the light is doing is going through the lens like this, but what the light thinks it's doing is going up and then forwards. And so it encounters the object three times. And because this is exact to the level of Maxwell's equations, it doesn't care about whether the fields are uh, near field or far field, all of them you see three times. And so this lens is perfect with a catch that you have to make it perfectly. And so um, there are some other things that I would have told you about, but I'm coming to the end of my talk. So I do want to leave a bit of time for questions. So I'm going to scoot through the experiments which show this happening, which have been made in the past and come to my summary. So metamaterials and transparent optics open new horizons for electromagnetism. They give materials which is difficult or impossible to achieve naturally. 
They can control light on all length scales down to a few nanometers as a perfect dose. A practical applications, for example, in the delivery of uh, mobile phone antennae for 5G signals. Sub wavelength microscopy for biological applications is currently being developed using concept from negative refraction. Um, cheap and efficient control of terahertz radiation, for example, in collision avoidance radar and automobile bios and satellite communications, uh, uh, one application. MRI is another, and of course, inevitably, they classify military applications, but I don't personally get involved in, in those, uh, not because I don't like the military, but because uh, I don't like the secrecy they require. And so with that, uh, I, I conclude my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, Professor Bantry, thank you so much. That was uh, indeed a delightful uh, talk, and uh, uh, I think all of uh, all of us who've been uh, so curious to know about, especially cloaking, uh, I think now have a very good idea about uh, what exactly is a physics and how ex what is exactly meant by cloaking. Thank you so much. So I think uh, maybe we can have a round of applause uh, for Professor Bantry. Thank you. So, uh, okay, so with your permission, we have a few queries. Uh, and I think since you've uh, put aside a little bit of uh, the time just for them, so maybe we can, uh, I could just uh, uh, ask those queries on the behalf of those who've written them out in the chat uh, session. Will that be okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Uh, so let's see. Um, Okay, so um, so there was a query by Sai Varun Oregunta, and the query is, uh, and I'm just uh, literally, I'm just reading what has been written. What if we can solve the distortion problem and create a warp drive, which can help us travel nearly at the speed of light? Is that possible? <laughs> um... People have been thinking about how to accelerate uh, objects to the speed of light. One way is to um, launch a satellite, which is very, very light, and uh, deploy from it uh, a huge sail. And then uh, from Earth, you can direct a laser beam onto that sail, and from the radiation pressure, you can accelerate that. So, so where do metamaterials come into this? But if you wanted to make a very, very large, very light cell, you would probably need to use metamaterials to make it. And people have talked about um, inter, uh, uh, interstellar travel. And to do that, you've got to uh, approach uh, the velocity of light because uh, to get there in a finite time, because the distances are so en uh, enormous. And that's one of the uh, projects that a guy called Harry Atwater in Stanford uh, has been uh, working on a, a micro satellite uh, with a huge sail that can be accelerated by light or, or more, more probably microwave radiation to um, accelerate it um, into a, 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 the orbit of another star. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, there is another uh... Longish query uh, by Aryaman, and uh, let's see. Um, okay, I'll just read it out. I mean, it says if a gravitational wave is traveling through space and light is incident on the gravitational wave, but the direction of propagation not being the same, uh, would there be any observational optical effects? In essence, say we have a bright electromagnetic wave source behind, say, a black hole merger. Would there theoretically be a way to detect these mergers optically? Yes, uh, if you distort space, then you have an effect on light. And in the sun, it's a case of a static distortion. But of course, if you have a gravitational wave, it's a propagating distortion. So the gravitational wave would act like a grating and would uh, diffract the light. The, the only problem is that as we know, 
gravitational waves when they reach the air. Fortunately, of course, they'd shake us rather violently if they weren't. Um, gravitational waves are very weak and a very long wavelength as well. Uh, so actually observing that diffraction effect might be quite difficult. Though, of course, they do indirectly use uh, laser light to detect gravitational waves in an interferometry, but that, that's, that's not my direct interaction with the gravitational waves. It's by bouncing off mirrors that are <coughs> distorted by the wave. Okay. Um, uh, so there's a query um, which is... Um, okay, so there's a query by... Um, uh, Zhu Jiu, and it's basically asks what is the what is what was the initial motivation for studying metamaterials, and how is it uh, doing? Uh, uh, I mean, what is the progress in this uh, area, and as regards application of the microwave frequency band instead of the visible band? Yes, uh, it was money. <laughs> 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 I, I had a I had a contract with the Marconi company, and they had they were working on radar absorbing material, and it worked very well, and they sold a lot of it. Uh, but the problem was they didn't know how it worked, and the radar absorbing material consisted of um, very fine um, uh, carbon fibers that were about. They're tuned to be resonant um, um, frequency of the radar waves, and they were picked up on a sort of filter paper out of. Uh, uh, so you had this sort of crisscross structure of um, carbon um, fibers. And although a single carbon fiber is very, very resonant and has a very, very sharply peaked response wave, so when you slap them all together, they. Um, they have a very broadband response and instead of scattering they absorb the question was what was going on theoretically and um, to cut a long story short um, what i realized was that the somehow the carbon fibers were talking to one another and you'd think because they touch that it will be through electrical conduction but it wasn't it was because a, a very thin wire when it supports an uh, electrical current uh, is surrounded by a, a magnetic field. And the thinner the wire, the stronger the field. And so when the wires overlap, it's like a little transformer between the two wires. And they were talking to one another magnetically, even though they were stimulated electrically. And that got me into the idea of function through structure. So I realized that it was actually the structure that was making these things do the job that they wanted to. and. The, the guys at Marconi were so excited by that, they, they said, well, for your next project, do what you want to design another better material. And that's how the split rings came up with the magnetism. And the more modern things which are, are being done, I talk, talk mainly about the historical aspects here, um, the, the origins of it. Uh, people are, are now going into meta surfaces. So they're designing, um, surfaces which are structured, uh, which can um, uh, direct and control light, which reflect on them. Uh, people are all also going into the domain of making metamaterials, which are, are not just static, um, in, in, but change with time. By doing this, you can make uh, surfaces which are reverse light. Um, you can also uh, do something we're working on currently is, is to have structures which can move faster than light. Now, you, you may think that's impossible, but um, think of the following example. Suppose you're sitting on the seashore and the waves are hitting the seashore. Now, um, if, if the waves are almost at right angles to the shore, they will, they will travel along the shore. But depending on the angle of instance, the point at which the wave hits the seashore can travel any way where from the speed of the wave right up to infinity. And it's not conveying any information, therefore it doesn't break any laws. So you, for example, you can have a grating that moves 
by simply locally modulating the, the material property point in the material, but phased in such a way that a wave appears to move. The medium isn't moving. It's, it's just that you, you vary its properties in a way it appears to move. And in doing that, you, you can simulate many of the effects that would actually happen if the me medium were moving superluminate. So, for example, you can um, have one of these moving material thing we're working on now, and you can make it emit Trencherenkov radiation into vacuum. Of course, the structure, but not the medium, is moving superluminate. All right. Uh uh, there are two more queries. Uh, one is by, we don't exactly know the name, but the, uh, the, there is an email address which says SSEN. Uh, so the, the query is as follows. So the refractive index and attenuation constant, this is the query I'm just reading it out. The refractive index and attenuation constant can be calculated from the two-level system of quantum optics. Similarly, these parameters, if calculated for the three-level system, give new phenomenon like stopping of flight, which is experimentally verified. Could you please shed some light on the quantum mechanical origin of the phenomenon of negative refractive index? Um, it doesn't have necessarily have a quantum origin, but you can use quantum mechanics to create it. So uh, quantum mechanics isn't necessary but it can be part of the process of, of creating it. And you, you, you of course, the, um, I, I explained that if you have a resonance, which is a response to some stimulus, for example, to a magnetic field, then if you tune through that resonance, then you get the opposite response, the, the other side. Now, atomic excitations are resonances that are sharply tuned phenomena. And it is true that if you tune through an absorption line of an atom molecule, it doesn't have to be as, as complex as a three-level system. Just a two-level system will do it. Um, the uh, response on the opposite side of, of that uh, transition will be a negative response. So if it's an electrical transmit transition, you'll get a negative polarization. And if it's a magnetic transition, you'll get negative magnetism from it. So quantum mechanics is not. But quite honestly, we've been having so much fun um, with, with the classical aspects of metamaterials that we're only just beginning to think about the quantum mechanics. And that's a whole new world you can get into with uh, things like uh, restral and bands, and also um, the wonderful things that can happen in, 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 in these um, um, very, very low temperature um, uh, atomic uh, solids that you can make, uh, where you can control them very precisely. And may maybe we'll, we'll see something like negative refraction which will be a very interesting thing because people have done things like stopping light, which involve um, which involves uh, an atomic transition being tuned to very ca carefully, where the uh, the group velocity goes to zero, the refractive index goes to infinity. But of course, on the other side of that, the the light should reverse its direction. So you could you could imagine easily getting a negative refraction in these atomic uh, solids, low, very, very low. Tips. Great. Uh, so there was a question by somebody who has uh, uh, the name YMP. I don't know what, they, what that is, probably uh, initials. The question is, what happens uh, for the perfect lensing when the index varies in time and space? Oh. <laughs> I haven't thought of that. Let me think about it now. Um, <laughs> do you know, I, I don't have an answer to that. Maybe the questioner would like to think about it and tell me what the answer is, but that will be an interesting exercise. I don't okay. know. Okay. All right. And uh, I, I guess uh, in the absence of uh, 
more queries that you'd like to put across to you. I might, I would probably squeeze in one little silly query of mine, uh, if, uh, if that's all right. Um, so I remember seeing a slide where you were talking about transformations of the, uh, the permittivity and permeability. And from the looks of it, it appeared that uh, they were actually objects which were transforming like uh, rank two pseudotensors or weight minus one or plus one, depending on how you define your pseudotensors. So, uh, I mean, could you say something more about that? Yeah, which slide was it? Was it this one? Or, uh, there, there was a back. transformation law uh, of where you went from, let's say, extra. Yeah, exactly that one. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's a hallmark yeah. for of, of, a, of a pseudotensor of rank uh, two. Um, yes, that's so, right. So in particular, what I'm asking is that how does the determinant lambda figure in the transformation? Well, that's just the inverse of these matrices. Okay. I mean, usually when you have, let's say, tensors of rank two, there will be no determinants. Like, for example, if we have these levitch vita tensors, we know that yeah. uh, just to ensure the fact that they are numerical tensors, uh, consistency requires inclusion of these weight factors, which is essentially the Jacobian. So I was wondering why it, the same arises here. What is the need of including uh, those uh, Jacobian? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I just just accepted the determinant there as, as part of uh, way coordinate form. I mean, that's a, a fairly regular formula you see for transformation coordinates. It's, um, um, I mean, wh where it comes in is if, if you, uh, if, if you um, write Maxwell's equations and then for the derivatives, you expand the derivatives as you normally do by the chain rule through these guys here. And of course, these derivatives all are associated with the in Maxwell's equations, okay? So the derivatives come on the left-hand side of the equation. And then to see what their effect is on the dielectric functions, which occur uh, multiplying the time derivative of the equation, which isn't affected by this particular transformation, to, to transfer that effect of the coordinate transformation from the left to the right, you have to invert a matrix. And when you invert a matrix, you inevitably get a determinant. Does that make sense? Okay, I, I guess, uh, yeah, okay. So I need to basically understand uh, where exactly this refract, this, uh, the, the primitivity would appear. Uh, so like we can talk about, of course, uh, a Maxwellian action in a curved space. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just need to uh, maybe just go, go through it in my head where, how, where exactly the refractive index would figure. And I think uh, yeah. this may be related to ensuring that that particular term transforms like a scalar. And that would necessitate inclusion of these Jacobians to guarantee that. Okay, yes. Well, okay. of course, with, with curl operator, you, you have a problem with the sign and space. So yes. I, think, I think that's where the complication arises. Yes. Okay, very good. I mean, okay, I mean, a curl uh, is a pseudo tensor. Yes, yes. I, I, yeah, I think I, I sort of, uh, yeah. Okay, I think I understand. I understand. Fine, great. So uh, I think uh, with that, we come to the, uh, the end of this session and this incredible uh, uh, lecture by Professor Pendry and his equally incredible patience uh, with all the queries. Thank you so much. And um, uh, I, I think uh, this, this has been a, a very, very interesting, uh, personally, even a, a very interesting learning experience. I had heard so many things about uh, cloaking. Now, at least I have uh, at least some idea about what it is. So uh, I'm it's sure- It's not just cloaking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm a Harry Potter uh, fan myself. Yeah, yeah, and so is your daughter, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really have a choice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, I, I think, uh, uh, thank you so much, Professor Pendry, uh, once again, for uh, your kind acceptance of the invitation to give a talk as part of the series. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Stay safe. So uh, uh, with this, we conclude uh, the session and uh, uh,
thanks uh, everybody for joining in and the team i'm uh, ending the meeting now thanks once again so much okay. bye bye thank you thank you professor